All right, everybody, well, let's go ahead and get started for today. Um, welcome to Basic Search Strategies for Systematic Reviews. Um, I'm going to drop a link in the chat really quickly that's a, a PDF version of the slide deck that we're going to use today, and we can send this out after the, the presentation today as well. Um, I also want to drop a link in the chat for the YouTube session um, from last week's workshop, um, so, so our very introductory workshop for systematic reviews. Um, but I'm going to give a chance for our um, our team to introduce themselves today. We'll we'll get set up and talk about what we're going to do, and then we'll we'll jump right in. Okay, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Alex Boucher. Um, I am a research instructional librarian. I am the library's liaison to the entire College of Human Environmental Sciences, the Department of History, Latin American, Caribbean, and Latinx Studies. Hi everyone, my name is Carly Reason and I am uh, the library liaison to most of the social sciences. And hi everybody, my name is Lance Simpson. I am the library liaison to most of the College of Engineering um, with the exception of chemical and biological engineering and also the Department of Biological Sciences. We are so excited to have you all here with us today. So a couple of quick things before we get started today. We are using Zoom again today to, to be a part of this. This is a part of the, the virtual world we all live in now, so you're all familiar with Zoom. But just in case you haven't had a chance to be particip participatory in Zoom um, up to this point, uh, we want you to feel comfortable to raise your hand during today's session. If you're on a desktop or laptop computer, you can do that by clicking the participants button there on the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll see a list of all the lovely people that are here with us today, but you'll also see a raise hand option there at the bottom. Um, the chat is going to be open, so you can feel free to, to use that as well. If you're joining us from a mobile device today and you'd like to, to raise your hand virtually or join by chat, you can click. Um, you have to tap your screen one time and then the more option will come available. One of those options will be chat and the other one will be raise hand. So if you'd like to do that, you're welcome to do that. And as Alex said earlier, you can see that red blinking light up in the corner of your screen. We are recording today's session. So please feel free if, if you do not want to be included in the video to, to turn your video off during the session today. But we, we will have a couple of spots for questions through the day, but you also should feel free to, um, to, to ask a question during the session as well. So one thing I always like to remind people when we get started for these, so we here at UA Libraries are here for you. So as we go through this, we're gonna talk about um, developing a search strategy for systematic reviews. One of the most important things that we like to, to remind folks um, from UA Libraries is that you can reach out to us at any part of your systematic review process, and we will be more than happy to talk through with you, um, do a research consultation, work through with you in developing some of these search strategies to show you some of the tools that we're going to talk about next week. But we are here for you. You can reach out to us anytime to, to set up an appointment for us to talk through that with you. So let's talk about what we're going to, to do today. So we, we have a, a, an ambitious agenda today. So, so a lot of fun things that we're going to do together. Um, first, we're going to talk about defining and developing that search strategy. Um, we're going to talk about identifying some of the relevant databases and understanding what to look for in a database whenever you're getting started. We're going to walk you through starting out with keyword searching and then going even deeper with using controlled vocabulary in your searches. We'll talk about citation trackers and how to use search alerts. We'll also talk about how to find gray literature. Um, last but not least, or kind of moving into last but not least, we'll talk about documenting those search strategies so that you can reproduce a search or so that someone can come behind you to reproduce your search. Um, and then we'll talk about actually developing that strategy. And then of course, we'll be wide open for questions at the end of the session today. And Alex, Carly and I are all reachable by email if you'd like to contact us after the session um, to, to ask questions as well. So I'm gonna turn it on over to Alex to ask what makes a good systematic review search strategy. All right, great. So yes, I am going to talk a little bit about developing a search strategy for a systematic review. Um, the subtitle of why keyword searching isn't enough is really just meant to hint at the fact that we think a good systematic review search strategy incorporates multiple methods of searching for articles and data, whether those are published articles or even unpublished articles. Um, so we will kind of get into what makes a good systematic review search strategy. And like Lance said, this is something that we could help you out with specifically if you are working on your own systematic review. This is one area where we can be brought in to consult. Um, if you intended the first session of the workshop series, you'll know that we talked about developing a systematic review protocol. And within that systematic review protocol, you are documenting your search strategy. So what 
goes into that? What, what is a good systematic review search strategy? Um, next slide, Lance, please. So there will be multiple facets to a good search strategy. The first two things I have listed here are really interchangeable as far as which comes first. You may well identify relevant databases as the very first thing that you do, or you may start with what is sometimes called a scoping search. We talked a little bit about this last time, but a scoping search is basically sort of a fancy word for an exploratory search, sort of your first search for articles on your topic. So what you're trying to do with this is, are, are, are three things mainly. Um, you're trying to determine, first of all, and at the most basic level, are there enough articles out there on my topic to justify or, or perform a systematic review? Um, like we've talked about, it, it's hard to put a number on that, like how many articles do you need for a systematic review? But in a perfect world, you would like to find at least five, 20 articles in your initial scoping search. So you wanna be able to find like, there are enough articles out there on this topic for me to do a systematic review. So the scoping search is usually just a simple keyword search on one of the more relevant databases or a few of the more relevant databases. So you're trying to find out if there are enough articles out there. Second, you may well use it to determine that your topic is a little bit too broad if there are just a gigantic amount of articles that seem to fit your inclusion criteria. And then third, this is more of a purely searching thing, but you can use the scoping search to start to develop a list of relevant keywords and subject headings. Now, if you're in the audience for this and you don't know exactly what we were talking about with subject headings or controlled vocabulary or anything like that, I promise we will get to it and hopefully explain it in a very clear fashion, but it's just another manner, manner of searching for articles. So when you're doing this, you are helping to kind of develop that list of things that you can use to search for articles. So again, with that or interchangeably, you are identifying relevant databases. And then when you go back for your primary search, when the, when the main search quote unquote starts, you'll be combining keyword searching with controlled vocabulary and subject heading searching. That is where you're really doing the most complex systematic searching. What you will probably find is that the articles you found in your scoping search, the ones that seem relevant probably were good articles that will show up in your final review. The more in-depth search that you will eventually do, it's more complex and systematic because you are trying to make sure that you are not missing any articles in addition to those articles that you found in your initial search. So outside of that, even after you've done the more complex searching, which we'll get into and explain, you are doing other things like tracking citations. Um, you can track citations in a couple of different ways, one forward and one backward. And what I simply mean by that is backward citation searching, you, you can track down citations, sources cited in a relevant article to see if those articles are also relevant and possibly useful. But also forward citation searching, you can see what articles cited a specific article that you have already found and you might be using. So you can do set track citation tracking in a couple of different ways. Then depending on your topic, you may need to incorporate a status strategy for searching the gray literature. And what we mean by gray literature, if you're not familiar with that, basically unpublished studies or unpublished data. And then finally, and we'll talk about all of these components as we go, documenting your search at each step along the way. That is important for a number of reasons. One, to ensure re reproducibility and transparency. And it also just may be required by, the, by where you were submitting your s systematic review to. So if we go back to what we talked about with, with keyword searching not quite being good enough, 
What we mean is basically that you should be incorporating multiple methods of searching to make sure that you find everything out there that would fit your inclusion criteria and everything out there that is relevant to your systematic review topic. Next slide, please, Lance. And with that, I believe we'll move on to Lance, who will talk about identifying relevant databases. Thank you, Alex. So getting started with, with what Alex was just talking about, getting your, your search strategy set up, getting started with, with where you're going to go from here, you want to first identify those relevant databases and you want to think about and understand how it is that those databases operate. What capabilities do they have? So depending on the, 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 the company that manages the database, each database has got a, a different setup with what tools that it may have available to it, but you want to know what those are. So getting started with what databases you should use or what databases you should start with, there's a couple of places that I would recommend um, starting out. And one is the list of databases that we have through the University of Alabama libraries. So I've got a link here. Um, and for those that are just joining, I'll, I'll drop this link back in the in the chat again with the slide deck. But I've got linked here to our A to Z database listing um, that's organized alphabetically by title, but it's also organized by subject. So if you're not sure where to start with, with databases, this might be a great spot to, to go. Another, um, if you attended last week or if you get a chance to watch our session for last week, one of the, the strong points that we talked about was looking at other systematic reviews before you get started. So other systematic reviews for your field. I specifically recommend taking a look at the methodologies in each of those systematic reviews and seeing which databases from your field are showing up the most in those. So you can get started with those databases to be able to move forward. And that can give you a good idea of where to start. You also can start with some very broad citation indexes. So that would include the, the Web of Science core collection, which I have linked here, and Scopus as well. And then last but not least, you can contact your subject library. And so I've got a, a link here with a, a list of all of the subject librarians here for, for UA libraries. Um, you can reach out to us and we can work through with you to find specific, um, specific databases that, that are for your subject. But I want you to think about it as you find those databases, I want you to take some time to explore around and see what tools are available to you through those databases. So as, as Alex talked about, you're going to be digging really deep. You're going to be looking for, for a lot of very specific information through these databases. And each of them have a very different set of tools that you can take a look at. Um, so one thing I recommend is to create an account. Very first and foremost, um, always use your UA address or your UA email address whenever you do that. Um, but you can create an account as soon as you get in that generally will allow you to be able to save um, searches, to save citations as you go along. Um, it also will sometimes open up a couple of additional features um, that are available. So one of the, or a few of the setups so that you can save and track your searches, I've got listed EBS or databases that are provided through EBSCO or the National Library of Medicine, um, Elsevier, Clarivate, and I'll mention a, a few of those um, as, as we go. They all have options to allow you to save your search history. So those are things that you want to be able to think about is, how can I save this? You're, you're going to want to reproduce the search. And that's something that, that um, Carly's going to talk about later is being able to, to reproduce your search. But you want to know what it is that you searched and when you searched it. Um, you want to see how it is you can actually export references to citation managers or export references out. Um, so, so each database has got a different way that it may do this, but you want to check and see what is the best way you can do this. You can keep up with the, with the articles that you're going to use in your final review um, to go forward. So the other tools and other things that you want to think about that we are actually going to talk a little further about this as we go along is how do you build search strings in the database? Does it allow you to be able to use multiple rows to build out your search string? And I will we'll illustrate what that looks like here in just a moment. What fields within a record can you search? How deep can you get into the record to be able to search? Um, can you use controlled vocabulary? Does the database have a thesaurus that you can, you can go to to see what specific control vocabulary terms your database has access to that, that you can do to, to more hone your search in? Um, so if you're using a citation index, and I, I noted that here, if you use multiple databases, and I always like to point this out because I, I'm, I work with, with the College of Engineering, um, one of the data or one of the discovery services that I use is Engineering Village. Engineering Village has access to several different databases. Web of Science is the same. There's several databases that we have access to through that. And each of those databases have their own control vocabulary. So you wanna make sure and see how it is that you can, can search control vocabulary. If you're searching multiple databases at the same time, how can you keep track and actually use the control vocabulary in those? Um, how do you use the basic and advanced search options? So what limiters, what, what, um, what fields can you search in those? Also, you wanna look at how your database uses Boolean operators, parentheses, 
Um, I, I always put brackets and quotation marks in here as well, because different databases handle all of these a little differently. And again, these are things that, that we're going to talk about in just a moment. Um, how does wildcard searching work or spellings? And I, I'll give the example. So IEEE Explorer actually will recognize both um, American and British spellings uh, for words. So we'll automatically search those for you. So you don't have to do quite as much wildcard searching using that particular database because it is set up to automatically do that. Um, some databases are set up to, to automatically stem. So they'll look for the, the ends of words. The, the, they'll do that so you don't have to use wildcard searching. But not all databases do that. You want to know, does the database that you're working in, do you need to use that wildcard searching? And we'll talk about what that looks like. Do you need to use that? Or what, what setup do you need whenever you go forward? So basically, you want to take some time to understand how your database works and how it is that, that you can feed information into your database that it can give you the proper results back. All right, so we're going to turn it over now to Carly to talk about actual keyword searching. So once you kind of get started and you identify your databases and um, are thinking about starting your scoping search or um, really starting to search for, for your resources, um, one of the ways we're most all familiar with searching is, is general keyword searching. So you open up the database and you see um, those search boxes and keyword searching um, works um, with natural language. So when we think about our topic and we kind of brainstorm ideas of what language best represents our, our topic, um, those are the keywords that we are typing in the search box. And most databases, when you type in and when you're doing your, your keyword search, the database is searching for these keywords in the record of the um, resource. And so when you're searching in a database and you open up the, if you select you know, the title of the article and it takes you to that page that has information like author and abstract and um, you know, subject headings and things like that, that page is called the record. And so that page is where most databases are trying to decide um, how relevant your keywords are. So that's the page that it's searching when it's populating your search results. So there are a couple of different ways and strategies that you can start to construct your keyword searches to be more robust and to capture um, more relevant data. So you all might be familiar with some of these, but I'm just gonna go through some general keyword searching strategies to keep in mind when you are conducting your research. So the first, um, strategy is search operators. And so these are those Boolean operators, the and, or, and not. So when you use and, it's retrieving records that include all of your search terms. When you use the word or, it's retrieving records that contain at least one of those terms and the term not will exclude terms. So capitalizing, I have a little note here, um, capitalizing the operator, the and, or, and not is just a best practice. Um, as Lance was mentioning, um, each database works a little bit differently. And so some databases, when you're conducting your um, search string, they'll require you to, um, or they'll, they'll work best if they're in um, all capitals, others don't require that as much. So just kind of in general, a best practice is putting those operators in capital letters. The next strategy that you can be thinking about is using parentheses in your search string. So parentheses specify the order of execution of your search string. So information within parentheses is read first, and then information outside the parentheses is read next. So an example we have here um, is composting and urban or city. And so we have urban or city in parentheses. So that search is gonna be conducted first. The database is gonna pull up any articles that are talking about urban or city um, um, on, that, on the record of the, of the resource. And then it's going to be looking for composting as it relates to those. So your final search will have records that contain the word composting and urban, and also records that contain the words composting and city. So this is a very small search string, but um, I have an example a little bit later on that will show how large these search strings can get when you're conducting a systematic review. And so parentheses will be um, very important and helpful to your searches. 
Um, there's a couple other different strategies. Um, the next, on the next slide, we have um, wild cards. So um, these uh, two of the some of the most common wild cards are using the question mark. And so this is useful when there are spelling variations for a word and you want to um, search for all variations at once. Um, not all databases, um, as, as Lance mentioned earlier, not all are going to be searching for term variations. Um, so if you have a word, in this example, we have behavior spelled two different ways. So if you put that question mark in after the O, the database is going to search for behavior spelled O-R and behavior spelled um, O-U-R. So thinking about um, when you're constructing your keywords and coming up with synonyms, the question mark will help come up with those um, variations in spelling. And the next wild card that's frequently used is the asterisk. And so this is called truncation. And this is used when you're looking for um, different endings of a word. So for example, if you were to type um, educate, ed, U-C-A-T with an asterisk after it. The database is searching for um, educate, education, educator, educating, and so on. And so as you're searching and as you're trying to gather um, all of the resources that are talking about a particular um, topic or idea, this truncation, this asterisk symbol will be really helpful because it's gonna be gathering more and more um, resources. Phrase searching um, is when you put quotation marks around a phrase. So um, for example, with social media, if you just left that without quotation marks, the database is pulling up articles that are talking about social. The database is also going to be pulling up articles that's talking about media. And it will also be pulling up articles that are talking about social media as a phrase side by side. But if you put quotation marks around the phrase, the database will be will be looking for those two words side by side. And so a lot of our research um, requires phrase searching and phrases. And so if that, if, if your research or your topic does have phrases in them, using quotation marks are gonna help your um, search and help the database populate resources that are much more specific to your topic. And then we um, have a proximity limiter. So this, there are a couple, um, there are a couple different ways to to structure a proximity limiter. But basically, this type of searching will retrieve records that contain your term, your your keyword within a number of words within one another. So, for example, if I was to conduct a search. Um, for city and then put the word near and then composting slash two. This is retrieving records that contain the words city and composting with a maximum of two words in between. So different databases have different ways to structure and to write proximity limiters. Um, so this example is used um, is being used with um, the Cochrane Library or ProQuest platforms, or also Web of Science, but things, databases like Ovid or Eric or other platforms might use a different way of, of structuring that, um, that, um, that keyword in, in the proximity limiters. So again, um, these are some general tips to keep in mind when you're constructing your search strings. Um, with phrase, uh, with your keyword searching, but these all work a little bit differently in different databases. And so um, again, getting to know the database that you're working in and seeing how they structure and how they work best with these different strategies will help you gather more specific um, and more tailored data related to your, to your topic. Um, and McGill Library has put together a really fantastic research guide um, that talks about not all databases, but a lot of really um, most frequently used databases. And they specify um, you know, what wild cards work in those databases. How does phrase searching work in those? How does the proximity limiter work? And that link is in our, um, at the end of our slides, there's a resources page and that link to their website is included on there. So 
Um, you can go to the specific database to kind of explore how it works, but there are a lot of great resources out there that exist that help walk you through kind of understanding how these might work with your specific database. So that's one resource. Um, and again, if you have questions about this, you can always reach out to your liaison and um, we can help kind of walk you through how exactly your database works in terms of some of these keyword searching strategies. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about a different type of searching than keyword searching, which is controlled vocabulary, using controlled vocabulary, subject searching, and so on and so forth. A, a couple of things with this. One, if you are completely new to this, um, it, it could be a little obtuse. So I'm going to try to make it not obtuse, but please feel free to uh, stop me and ask a question or put a question to chat, uh, either one really. Second, when I'm talking about this, a lot of times I'll use the terms control vocabulary or, or subject headings or subject terms or subject searching, and it may sound a little interchangeable. Um, a controlled vocabulary system is a system that uses standardized and organized words in order to describe information sources. And by information sources, I mean articles, books, conference proceedings, so on. Um, subject terms or subject headings are those standardized descriptive words that are assigned to information items. For your purposes, what you need to know is that many, um, not all, but many databases are organized this way. This is sort of the central organizing feature of many databases. Because of that, it, it can be the most efficient, effective, organized way of searching those databases. Um, next slide, please, Lance. I say many databases use this system, but, but not all do. Um, I have a few examples here, and there are even some caveats with some of these examples. The Web of Science general collection does not really use a controlled vocabulary system. I believe some of its individual component databases do, but, but the overall database, the overall collection does not. Google Scholar does not use controlled vocabulary, and, and this is not even a comprehensive list. There are some databases that do not use it. That is one thing when you are looking at databases and you are identifying databases and understanding their, their capabilities like Lance was talking about. This is an important thing to figure out. Does your database use a controlled vocabulary system, a subject heading system, a thesaurus, and so on? Um, because if they do, that should change how you go ahead and search them. My, my last bullet point is sort of flip, but are they like hashtags? Kind of. I will oftentimes describe subject headings as hashtags to classes full of undergraduates. When I do talk about subject headings to classes full of undergraduates, they are not really subject hashtags. It's sort of a reductive way of looking at it, but in some ways they are sort of like hashtags. They are words used to describe a, a certain topic or information. And a lot of times you can actually click on subject headings and when you do that, it will take you to all of the articles that have been tagged with that subject heading. So in some sense, they're sort of like hashtags. We'll get into that more as we go on. Uh, next slide, please, Lance. So some examples of subject heading systems, of controlled vocabulary systems, and, and where they are on databases. PubMed is a big one. I, I teach PubMed quite a bit. PubMed does have a subject heading system. It's a little bit hidden away, but if you're on the main page of PubMed, if you'll see under Explore on sort of the bottom right-hand side, you'll see the MeSH da database. MeSH stands for the Medical Subject Headings, and, and that is their system. Next slide, please. A couple more examples, APA PsycInfo, 
you will see this layout a lot with EBSCO host databases. In this case, at the very top, you will see APA thesaurus of psychological index terms. Thesaurus is another word in addition to things like subject headings that you will see often. So if you see that, that will generally be their controlled vocabulary system. On the next slide, I believe we will be looking at CINAHL Plus with full text which is a health and nursing database, another EBSCO database. In this case, you will see instead of the source, you will see CINAHL subject headings. So if you see those various things, you can click on them and begin to explore their subject heading system. And that's what I will begin to talk about, how you use these to actually search the databases. So next slide, please. There are a lot of ways to describe this, but, but why do you use them? Um, again, going back to, this is the way these databases are largely organized. So searching by these can be the much more precise way to find your information. Keyword searching, you can use the strategies that Carly was talking about to really drill down a keyword search and make it much more precise. But a keyword search in its sort of natural state is sort of high variance or there is a certain amount of randomness to it. Um, because these databases, when you're keyword searching, they are mostly just looking for the words that you put into them. Um, so you have issues with spellings or related terms. And so there is a level of randomness to it. With subject headings, you sort of get away from that randomness to some extent. And I'm gonna show this through a, a quick example on PubMed. Um, let's look at the next slide. Okay, so here's an example. This is a very basic search on PubMed. Um, I have just typed in high blood pressure. I haven't even done like phrase searching. None of that really matters. Um, in this case, you get 630,000 results. Of course, if you were doing a systematic review, you were, you were being much more specific with your searches. But these are the, the articles that come back. Let's look at the next slide uh, of an, extremely related concept. In fact, pretty much the same thing. High blood pressure, hypertension, basically the same thing. Different terms used to describe the different, same thing. In this case, you get 540,000 results. You'll see though that even though hypertension and high blood pressure are pretty much the same thing, searching for different words brings back different articles. Because with keyword searching, these databases are, are smart and adaptable, but in the most basic state, they are just looking for the words that you type in. Um, so they will often miss related terms. They will often miss related spellings. And, and it's, it's a little bit more random. If we can go to the next slide. This is the MeSH database, oh, PubMed's control vocabulary system. So if you type in high blood pressure, what it will do is it will tell you to use the word hypertension. In fact, you could just click on the box next to hypertension and add it to PubMed search builder and then search PubMed. And what would happen is you would find every article or information source on PubMed <clears throat> that has had the tag hypertension added to it. So because of that, you're getting rid of some of the variants. You know that every single article that comes back, someone, something has gone through and said, this article is about hypertension. Doesn't matter what term they used for it. This is about hypertension. Therefore, we are going to give it this search subject heading and then it will come up in that subject heading search. If we can go into the next slide, instead of adding it to the search builder, I, I could click on it and we can see more about this subject heading. A couple of things with this. One, subject headings or thesaurus systems are always hierarchical. So what that means is, above hypertension in the hierarchy is things like cardiovascular disease, and then eventually just diseases, basically. Below it are more specific 
aspects of hypertension or just more specific illnesses. But also you have subheadings for each. So I could search for hypertension and diet therapy or metabolism or mortality or any of those. Even below that, you'll see a little button that says restrict to mesh major topic. And I actually can show you in the next slide, um, you'll see that I have done that. And what this does is all 186,000 articles that come back have not only been tagged with hypertension, but they have been tagged with hypertension major topic. So what that means is hypertension isn't just an aspect of each of these articles. It is one of the primary focuses of the article. The reason why you still have 186,000 results is this is still a very broad search. So what you could do at this point are, is add another subject heading or maybe two subject headings, or like in the next slide, I have just added a keyword to it, dash diet. So we have gone down to 400 results. This is not the most precise and organized way of doing it because the most precise systematic way of doing it would be seeing if there's a subject heading for dash diet and including that in the search. But this is a more precise way of searching for this topic than just typing in the keywords hypertension and dash diet. Um, because you just know that hypertension is a major focus of every single article in here. It, again, if that doesn't make sense, or if I haven't explained it well enough, please stop me with a question. I do have a few more things to talk about in relation to this. One of these is that I've been showing PubMed, but subject heading systems, and Lance or Carly could add, a, add something at some point, are, are relatively similar on most databases. Um, maybe next slide, and I can show a couple more quick things. Okay, so one, this, the picture on the right is what you will find. What Carly was talking about the record page. In the record page of an article on pretty much any database, you will see keywords, but you will also see the subject headings. So when I was talking about the scoping search, using that to come up with keywords and subject headings, that is one way that you can do this. When you go out and do a, a keyword search for your topic, you will find articles and you can see the mesh terms. You can also click on these. So I could click on the one that says dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And if I did, I would get every single article in PubMed that has been tagged with that or indexed with that term. The other thing you might note, and this can be a little bit different from database to database, is that in this case, you'll see two things, two subject headings that have asterisks by them. In PubMed, that means these are the major topics. So these are the major concepts, like they are more important to this article than weight loss or sodium, for example. You will see this, like I said, on pretty much every database. So this is not just a PubMed thing. Uh, next slide, please. And in fact, I do not have any more slides. We're gonna pass it over to, I believe, Carly, but I will just finish up by saying, that the reason for using subject headings, again, is it's just a more organized way of searching. You can use it in combination with keyword searching as I did. And in some basic databases like PubMed and other databases as well, it's really the primary way of searching. In fact, in a systematic review, if you were using PubMed extensively, the keyword searching is almost the secondary form of searching in a lot of ways. It's a way of, making sure that you didn't miss anything or making sure that PubMed didn't miss anything and accidentally not give an article its correct subject term, if that makes sense. So with that, I will pass it on to, I believe, Carly. Great, so once you've kind of identified keywords or, and from there, the controlled vocabulary, next you can figure out how you're going to 
construct these in the database. And so one way that you can start to search is with um, a strategy called field searching. And so this is telling the database exactly where to search for keywords in the record. And depending on your inclusion or exclusion criteria, um, some will be more specific about where they, um, where they conducted their search. So um, this is an example of um, uh, two ways to construct a field search. So you'll see here we're in Academic Search Premier. We've put together um, our um, parentheses searching for test scores or grades or academic performance. And these are not um, subject terms. These are just keywords. And you can see on the right, the drop-down box says title. And so what this means is that the database is looking for these terms only in the title of the article. And you'll see in the second box, we're looking for these same terms, but in the abstract um, of the, uh, the abstract that's been provided on the record. And so some, you'll see when you're looking at other systematic reviews, some um, researchers are being incredibly specific about where they're searching for this specific language. Um, and depending on um, different, um, like Cochrane or, or Pros uh, Prisma, there might be different ways of how different field searching that you want to conduct or try searching. So not all systematic reviews are only using a title or an abstract search. It's more dependent upon your research and the guidelines that you're looking at when you're conducting your systematic review. So here is one example where you can use those drop down tools on the database. And again, different databases are gonna have these in different places or look a little bit different. On the next slide, we'll see um, an image of uh, an entire search string that um, is using field searching instead of selecting the drop down fields and selecting title, you can see on this first line, the TI that's standing, that's, that's representing title. And so if we put TI and then parentheses, uh, we have this very long um, search string. And this is coming from a published systematic review um, by Whiteman et al. And he, this, their research team um, uh, is in this example is conducting a title search, but they're also, they use that Boolean operator or, and they're looking for um, these same terms in the abstract. And this is only one tiny piece of their entire search string. This actually, I broke it up into these two kind of sections. So you can look and see, okay, TI, we have our title and then AB, we have abstract. But this was actually put in one line, like one of those boxes in the database because they have additional lines of terms. So, if you have um, these very long keywords and um, controlled vocabulary that you are using these very long search strings, using these kind of abbreviated terms will help as you're constructing your um, search string. And again, different databases have different um, abbreviations for different ways of field searching. So again, that's one other thing that you want to be aware of. Um, so TI is title in, in this database that this, this research team was looking in, but it might be different um, in a different database. So um, again, field searching is just one way to help you identify where in the record the language and the, the words are being identified in. Um, so that's, that's one search strategy that you can be thinking about. Um, the other search strategy on the next slide is um, something called uh, search filters. And so search filters are, um, they're standardized search strategies. So a search filter is, it's also called a search hedge. And so these are search strings that have been already developed um, and help define a certain criteria for your research. So um, they're search strings that represent um, 
different aspects of a research topic so they can help identify clinical concepts. They can help identify various levels of evidence like randomized control trials or systematic reviews or meta-analysis. But there are these search strings that have been pre-constructed um, that you can use to help with your systematic review. So they will help save time as you're conducting your search. They can help you be more thorough because typically, not always, but some of these search filters have been um, gone through trials and have been tested to make sure that yes, they are comprehensive um, and they are um, pulling as much data as possible. So um, I don't have any examples on here of what these look like. They look similar to the previous slide where we had that very long search string with parentheses and different wildcards. Um, but there are many resources out there that will take you to these pre-constructed, pre-defined um, search filters. So on this slide, we have um, Columbia University, the Irving Medical Center, they have um, a whole list of different search hedges that you can use, um, as they say, to really help optimize your search strategy. The National Library um, of Medicine has put together um, quite a few different search filters for different um, topics. Uh, they have, I'm not sure how many they have, but they have quite a few that they have um, put together. UAB Libraries, they have another page full of different search filters. Um, as well as the University of Texas, their School of Public Health has put together um, a very comprehensive page um, specified by database. So again, we kind of keep coming back to this point of how each database works a little bit differently. Search filters work differently and are very unique and specific to a particular database. So on the next slide, we talk about how do you choose a search filter? So the previous slide had links to help you find different search filters, but how do you choose one that's most appropriate for your research? So one, you're thinking about how current um, is the search filter. So language changes, terms get added. Um, so make sure that what you're looking at in the search filter you're using is the most current and the most up to date. Um, also be thinking about is the search filter designed for the database you are searching in. So again, search filters are not interchangeable across databases. They're very specific to the database that you're looking in. And those resources that I have listed specify um, which search filters are for what databases. And the reason why they're so specific to a database is what Alex was talking about is that controlled vocabulary. They're using the controlled language on um, those, um, uh, the controlled vocabulary for that specific database. And so the controlled language that you might be using in PubMed might not transfer to um, APA Psych Info. There'll be very different um, ways of, of um, constructing that controlled vocabulary. So um, again, uh, the search filter is designed for the specific database. Uh, and then the other thing you can be thinking about is was the search filter tested? So typically when you discover or identify the search filter that you are looking for, there should be some information or some guidance of to how that was tested. And that will um, help you kind of determine how reliable you find that search filter to be. So those search, uh, search, filters as well as um, field searching are two different ways it, within the database to use the tools of the database to help you find more a more comprehensive search of the um, of information that you're looking for for your um, research. Awesome. Thanks, Carly. So I want to talk quickly about citation tracking and, and alerts and, and how, how to be able to kind of keep track with with some of the resources that you're looking at, um, how to be able to kind of follow up with your searches. So once you've got your search string developed, um, you want to think about tracking the research and, and how it fits your search criteria. So I, I've listed a few databases here um, that will allow you to, to kind of 
walk through and be able to save your searches and to be able to, to get alerts for those searches. Um, there's something I want to mention before I, I talk about saving those searches and getting alerts for those searches, though, and that is being able to go backward and forward, as Alex talked about earlier, with citation tracking. So one of the important things, and, and there are a lot of databases that allow this. Again, you'll have to look for the specific database to see what how it's built and how, how it's built out. But many databases, and I know that that quite a few of those um, with Clarivate, so with, within Web of Science, I know that you can do this in public. Med with the Elsevier products like Scopus, Science Direct, um, all of the, the databases through Engineering Village, you can actually look to see who else has cited a particular article and what articles this um, a, a particular article has cited. So you can move backward and forward to be able to see what other research may be out there, what other search terms, so what other subject headings may have been included with those articles. It's a good way to, to work in, in kind of building out your search. Um, I also, I'll, I'll show you in just a moment how with a couple of these that you can track if there is a particular article that fit well with your research, how you can in, track the citations for that. Um, but with this, with these discovery services and with these tools, you can actually do some uh, saving your searches and setting up search alerts for those. So I've got those listed out here um, and they're, they're linked out. So many of those allow that um, the EBSCO databases, APA SOC Info, CINAHL Plus, um, the, the NCBI databases, PubMed, PubChem. Um, you can even look at that with Google Scholar as well. So you can get alerts for um, searches that you've done or searches that, that you want to see what other resources have, have um, pinged with those searches. Um, I've got an example here with these tools. So I, I have a few of these set up myself, email alerts to be able to come through. Um, so I, since I do a lot of things in engineering, I've, I've got one down at the bottom here that you can see that I, I've used in the past. Um, this was the full search string um, set out for, from that that I have set to, to ping whenever it comes through. Um, so it, it pulls out um, and I, I'll point you'll note there's some brackets in there or in this search string as well. And for engineering village specifically, it keeps it from searching related keywords. I wanted just the phrase that I was looking for. So that keeps those brackets in there. But I've got it set up to send me an email whenever any of these these come through. You can also set alerts for some of these for whenever they appear in another article. Um, but it's a great way to be able to keep track throughout your systematic review of how your search string is what other um, works may be pinging on your search string as you go through. And I did want to show you really quickly with Scopus and with Web of Science, you can also look for a specific article. Um, you can see when it's been cited. So it, continuing on through the process, depending on how long the process is, if you have an article that was really important to, to what it is that you're looking for, you can see what other works are citing it as you go forward. So I'm going to pass it on over to Alex to talk about gray literature. Oh, okay, I'm going to try to talk about this relatively briefly. Um, uh, we uh, we're getting a little close to one. Um, so gray literature, basically, when I say gray literature, what I what I'm talking about mostly is basically unpublished literature. Um, so, for examples, or, or literature that is published outside of traditional commercial publishing. So dissertations and theses, conference proceedings unpublished clinical trials or unpublished trial data, government reports, patents, et cetera. Um, next slide, please, Lance. Um, so basically, depending on your topic, you may well need to incorporate searching for gray literature. Um, that's something that you will decide or, or figure out when you're working on your search strategy. But then if you do decide that and you need to search for gray literature, where to go to find it. Um, for one, you can go to a number of places, but a lot of gray literature you can find on either Google or Google Scholar. I, I have some examples linked. There are some specific custom Google searches that you can use. Then there are just some specific websites, which you could just book bookmark because they are very important for this. Um, Open Gray is good for European gray literature. Clinicaltrials.gov is a very self-explanatory title. Um, and there are also guides to where to find gray literature. You can also look at databases specifically, but like I was saying, a lot of things are on Google. So I thought I would give you a couple of quick tips for using Google, because the thing to know with this is there is no way to search for gray literature on Google as systematically as you might on one of our databases. Uh, if you figure out how to use PubMed or CINAHL Plus or PsycInfo and you, you understand subject headings and keyword searching, you can search in a very efficient, systematic way. 
Google, you are never going to be able to search it in quite as efficient a way, but there are some things that you can do to make it a little easier. One is site searching. A lot of the unpublished gray literature might be on .gov sites. So a search for site.gov along with your keywords would only find articles from .gov sites. Or you could search for a specific site like cdc.gov or hhs.gov. The file type PDF is definitely not something you have to do, but a lot of these reports are in PDF format. So that could be another way of doing this. Next slide, please. A couple of other quick things that you might know is that a lot of the things that you do on databases, you can still do on Google. Phrase searching works, parentheses work. I don't have an example of this in this search, but you could do parentheses with type 2 diabetes or diabetes mellitus. It would work similarly to how it would on a, a normal database. Um, in this case, I'm searching just site cdc.gov. So that way I only get things from that one specific website. And then the last couple of things, slightly advanced Google searching that you might know about um, are just ways to narrow your searches down in title or all in title. Um, in title would have your search terms in the title of the article that comes back. All in title would make it so that every search term you have has to be in the actual title of the article. So again, these are none of these are musts, but they are just ways of narrowing down your search on Google and being a little bit more precise because it is a little bit harder to be more systematic when you're doing a Google search. Um, on the next slide, I'll just show a couple of linked out resources. Oh, well, actually, sorry, the, the advanced search screen. Google hides the advanced search screen like it's sort of like an embarrassing uncle or something. But there is an advanced search on Google. Um, on the previous page, you would have seen there's a on the regular Google page, there is a settings button. So right under the search bar settings, if you click on that, you can click on advanced search and the this page will open up which just has all of your options um, up at the top of the screen all of these are basically boolean operators all of these words is and any of these words is or none of these words is not and then you have the rest of it you can control at the bottom of the screen so again just a way of being more precise with your searches because it, it is difficult to find gray literature um, on my final slide for this again i just have a few examples of databases you can use, uh, library databases or otherwise. Um, Scopus Web of Science, SciFinder, all good for conference proceedings, abstracts and presentations. And then for database theses and dissertations, you have ProQuest dissertations and theses, Ethos for dissertations from the United Kingdom. And you can also find dissertations and theses on Google Scholar. And that was sort of a condensed version, but that is uh, some of the things that you can do if you need decide that you need to find gray literature for your systematic review. All right, so really quickly, these are our last slides um, to document your searches. So your systematic review, it needs to include enough details about your search so that it's replicable. Um, important information to document are things like databases searched, the database time coverage, what search strategies you used for each database, including search terms and filters and limiters, um, the date each search was conducted, and the number of results for each search strategy. And you may also want to include the number of results after um, deduplicating the articles. The next slide has um, some strategies for documenting these. So you can use research logs, so you can create a spreadsheet or a document to keep track of all your searching. Um, I also um, have met people who like to use a PowerPoint slide. So for each new search, they create a slide. So it's a more visual way of seeing and interacting with each new um, search. There's also a Prisma flow diagram and that um, image on, is on the next slide. And this is, oh, um, that's on a couple other slides from here, but um, this slide, these, these next couple of slides here are just um, different ways to document your search. These are coming from Cornell University Library. So you can see here um, 
different information you can include just uh, in general, what databases you're searching in, kind of some of the general information. And the further you get into it, then how do you document each specific search string? What number of search results are you getting um, in a specific database? So you're keeping track of each search string you construct in that database. Um, and the next slide is just another example of, okay, you are in, um, you're searching in database number two and you would copy and paste this um, as an outline for database number three. And these are different ways that you can keep track of your um, databases and your search strings and what search results you are populating. There are lots of resources like this out on the web. This is just a few. This link is listed in our resource page. And the last slide here is um, the Prisma flow diagram. So this oftentimes is published or can be published in your final systematic review. And this helps you walk through records identified, um, records after duplicates were removed and so on. So, um, it is one o'clock, so I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, we really ran uh, ran pretty quick, but there's our resource page if you want to access any of these links. And um, we can stick around if anyone has any questions, um, but we also have our third um, workshop coming up and the link to that um, is on our slide here. And we're happy to answer any questions you have in that um, session as well. So thank you all so much for attending and I'm sorry that we went right up to time.